All right. Um, it is top of the hour, and I would like to welcome everybody here to the Sage 100 Year End Tips and Tricks. Uh, again, my name is Mary Hildinger, and I am a software consultant with DWD Technology Group. Um, in the crowd today is Brad Prather, and he is another one of our uh, Sage software consultants. Brad, you want to say hello? Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. Um, so this afternoon, what we're going to go ahead and do is uh, kind of review some things about what I consider the core accounting modules as in the first half of the session. We'll take a little break and then we'll go on with uh, payroll specific things in the latter half today. Since this is a webinar and there are a pretty significant number of people who are in attendance, I am going to keep microphones muted. Uh, however, if you need to um, get our attention, Brad is watching the questions box and the chat boxes. Um, he's also watching if anybody is raising hands. Um, just as a quick test, can I get everybody to click on your raise hand button? Getting some good activity there. All right, awesome. Um, we'll go ahead and get those put down. Uh, if you have questions or issues, raise your hand. We'll try and keep an eye on that. If it's something that you want to have a little discussion about, please use your questions box in order to uh, enter that question. That does a couple of things. First of all, it gets it into a more permanent log so that if we don't either get you an answer or we don't get a chance to finish the answer during our webinar today, uh, Brad and I will have a record of that and we'll certainly be able to come back to you and uh, follow up with whatever you might have. <clears throat> during the course uh, of the webinar, you know, you are certainly welcome to ask us questions at any point. Um, towards the end of each half, there will be a, a generic open session where we will effectively allow you to ask uh, questions about uh, what we've talked about or maybe even if there's something that we need to do that isn't necessarily a part of the webinar and we'll guide how we, we respond to that. <clears throat> Pardon me. If any of you folks are uh, CPAs out there and you would like to get some CPE credit, uh, we all know that this is the crunch time and we've got two weeks left to get our credit in for this reporting cycle. And I know I am scampering to get my credits in for this uh, three year period. Please contact Shannon Barnhart and her email address is there displayed as barnhart at dwdtechgroup.com. Just put a, a note in um, the subject about CPE credit and um, she'll make sure that letters get out to you. Today, uh, obviously we've done the welcome. Uh, I wanna just give you a, a brief overview of DWD. I recognize a number of names out there, but there are quite a few names whom I don't recognize. Uh, so if you're not necessarily working with us, I wanna make sure you know who DWD is and um, got a couple of things that we'll talk about as far as um, points of note. We'll talk briefly about the order of closing modules. Uh, for those of us that have a calendar year as our fiscal year definition, we're gonna be getting ready to do that year end processing. Um, we'll go into specifics regarding AP, AR, and GL, uh, things that we want to consider for year end. And then we will take a break. And after that, we'll follow up with the second half of the session, which will be um, the payroll topics about which we'll discuss. DWD Technology Group. Um, DWD Technology Group is a division of a full service accounting firm, Dula Morton Dewald. Dula Morton Dewald in and of itself has been in existence since 1939. And the technology division was established 30 years ago in 1990. Uh, we have three physical office locations. The main accounting and technology office is in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We have an accounting office that is in Marion, Indiana, and we have a technology office in Indianapolis. Um, of our staff of about 60 some employees, there are approximately 25 of us in the technology group. 
Um, there are a handful of CPAs. I'm trying to do the count off the top of my head, and I think there's about six or seven of us in the technology group that have CPAs. Um, we have not only software consultants, but we also have network um, capable individuals, and virtually all of them are at least Microsoft um, network engineer certified or some other comparable designation. Uh, things that DWD Technology Group can do for you, uh, we can deal with software and business consulting. We can help you analyze your processes and we can help you find a software solution that will uh, give you the most benefit for what you're tracking in your line of work. We have a lot of experience with manufacturing and distribution as well as core accounting. And uh, we also, with our one part of our team, we have some capabilities with the not-for-profit sector as well. Uh, we list here our primary products with which we work, and you will notice that virtually all of them are SAGE-related, or um, and, and even the MIP at one time was under the umbrella of SAGE software. SAGE 100 is our flagship product, and uh, that's why we're all here today. Uh, we also work with a newer product called SAGE Intact, um, some of you folks who have been on Sage Business Works and have come up through the ranks to Sage 100, I've worked with you in the past on that. Sage 50, uh, formerly known as Peachtree. Again, I think I've got a few folks out there that I've helped convert from Sage 50 to Sage 100. MIP Fund Accounting, that's our not for profit niche software. Fixed Assets, HRMS, Human Resource Management Software, and Sage CRM, our Customer Relationship Management Software. These are all things that we can help you with and tie things together for you. As part of our software services, uh, we do a pretty much everything, training, support, setup, uh, troubleshooting, um, software upgrades, customizations, custom report writing, data conversions, integrations with external systems, including websites, uh, among other things. We've got um, business reporting through various business intelligence features, um, a lot of manufacturing functionality, manufacturing efficiencies and work order scannings and efficiencies, warehouse automation, um, again, integration with external systems, so lots of, lots of expertise in those areas, um, lots of really, really smart guys with whom I am very blessed to work. And uh, somewhere among us, somebody's gonna help you find a solution that you need. All right, here we go. Some important announcements. Um, for those of you folks who have been on Sage 100 for some time, even those folks that were in the old Mass 90, Mass 200 days, we used to have these nifty little three-letter acronyms, my TLAs, I would like to call them, the IRD and the TTU. And you notice the big red circle slash. That is because with the advent of uh, Sage 100's payroll 2.2 functionality, these features are no longer available. Um, so as of Sage 100 2018 or newer, we don't install IRDs or tax table updates like we used to in the past. Um, eventually this screen's gonna go away in future years, but I just wanted to point out that this is, this is a big thing. I'm start, I had been getting some questions about, oh, do we have to do the IRD this year? And it's like, nope, you're not on a version that needs it anymore. And again, do I need to install it? Nope, um, as of version 2019, that was no longer necessary. And if you are on um, any older versions, uh, we want to probably talk with you and actually have you consider making your upgrade. We've, Brad and I have been doing a lot of these this year, especially with all the changes that have come with uh, payroll processing from the government. <clears throat> so what is SAGE support and for how long? Um, SAGE typically has adopted the policy across most of its product lines that it will support the current year's version, which in our case is 2020, and one or two years prior. Uh, Sage 100 will support two years prior. Some other software with which I work only supports the one year prior. So we are looking at Sage 100 2020, 2019, 
or 2018 as being viable options that are available to be supported by SAGE. Now, will DWD support them? We will to the best of our ability, of course. Uh, however, if we get in a pinch where you folks uh, are having such an issue that we can't resolve, ha you have to make note that we cannot get support from SAGE. They won't support us either. Uh, so we might have to actually consider doing an update for you. And what SAGE typically does is about a three-year window as far as the um, release of the current version versus the release of the version, or I'm sorry, the year in which they will um, end the support. So anybody on payroll or on uh, 2018, uh, you're looking at this 2021 being your last support year. Payroll itself, if a few folks are using that, that is its own beast and has its own numbering scheme. Uh, my recommendation with that is just keep that updated pretty much at all times uh, because you never know what programmatic functions are available and certainly you wanna make sure you keep up with um, tax table updates. So that's the support window. Um, now let's talk a little bit more about what do we do for year end? Um, well, the year end, uh, first thing we probably really want to do is get a copy of our software. And we have information, I believe, on our website in our tips and tricks, and correct me if I'm wrong, Brad. Um, but then from there, what we want to be able to do is to close our modules. And, and Sage recommends a particular order for these modules to be closed because of how various modules feed into other modules. So um, our general rule of thumb is that if you look at your menu, we typically go from the bottom up. And, if, and I know you probably all can't picture that yet, but um, Bill of Materials is one of the bottom sorted modules in the original listing of the modules. Um, work order then would be above that. And then if you're using barcode, purchase order processing, sales order, inventory, and all the way up through the general ledger. So your general ledger is the last module which we would close because it is the one that if you do close it, you cannot post back into those historical periods. So once we get all of those closed, let's start talking about the specific modules that we want to point out today. Um, my big three are your AP, AR, and your general ledger. Um, I always talk to folks and I explain to them when they're getting ready to do their year end, reconcile your balance sheet. And because we can prove a balance sheet, we can't prove income. I can't tell you whether it was a sales account that should have been affected or a negative expense or you know something of that nature, but I can look in my records and I can say, I have a bank statement I can balance. I have my aging for my payables and my receivables that I can balance. I can do a physical inventory count and I can come up with a value of my inventory. These are all our balance sheet accounts. These are all provable. And so if we can prove these things out, then however we organize the information that's left over is what our net income effectively is. So to deal with our accounts payable, a good thing that we want to do, and, and I would strongly recommend that we do this at least every year, if not every period. Um, when we want to go through our closing process, uh, let's go look at um, making sure that all of our data is updated and posted. And not only does this include the accounts payable module, but it also includes modules that are related, such as your purchase order or job cost or work order. Um, that is that is the the key pieces of stuff that all plays along with AP. Then we want to print reports, and um, I threw out a few reports that are are recommended, but there are absolutely others that you might use. Um, of course, the AP aging report, and I do want you to keep in mind that the aging report and the AP trial balance report. They have similar information that they present, but they have different purposes and they have different sources of information. Your aging report actually looks at the document date of your invoices. 
So if I have an invoice dated December 16th, then that's going to go into my December bucket of transactions. But if I take that same December 16th invoice and I post it to the general ledger in either November or January, because I'm not paying attention to my dates, then my general ledger is not going to behave and be in alignment with the details that I have on my aging report. So aging report can give you the details that comprise your invoices. The AP trial balance report is the report that uses general ledger information. It uses the posting date that the general ledger got affected in order to tell you how that report lays out. And this is the better report with which you can reconcile your AP to your general ledger account information. Check history report. That is another um, good report that you might want to have available. You can certainly print a physical copy or we can um, help you make sure that your paperless office is set up and we can print those and store them in our electronic filing cabinets. Uh, some other goodies here that we have as far as accounts payable. Um, we've got the vendor purchase analysis report, the monthly purchase report, the payables analysis report, check, um, and then I, I kind of double dipped on the check history report, but we can, um, that's like I said, that's a good one to, to run. Let me mention briefly about the monthly purchase report. Anywhere in SAGE that you see some report that has some sort of a title, typically either a monthly or possibly a quarterly, although that's a little less true in payroll now, those reports are effective for your current open period. So if my calendar in my AP options says that my calendar is in October of 2020 and I am trying to run a monthly purchase report thinking that I'm going to get December information, I will not. My monthly purchase report will be reflective of the current month that is open for that module. So, um, and, and a lot of people are like, well, why can't I change the dates on that? Kind of a throwback, I think, from the, the way back days of the software when it was first conceived. And they just never gave that opportunity to throw date ranges in there. However, there are so many other reports that allow you to run data by specific date ranges or, or vendor ranges or, or whatever. You can, you can do a lot of uh, organization in that manner. Okay. So what happens when we do the AP year-end process? Um, we know that as we go through and we do our monthly closings, our calendar rolls forward. And then um, when it comes time to the end of the year, what happens there? Uh, some specific things that happen, uh, and they might also happen similarly during a month-by-month -month closing, but your number of days to retain paid invoices. That's a setting in our software where we get the ability to say, how long do I want to continue to see invoices in my vendor maintenance or inquiry files for historical lookup? And if I set that number, I'm gonna actually pull this on here. If I set that number to something other than zero, then it means that for each period that I close up to the number that is magically set here, once I surpass that particular number, any invoices that closed prior to that window of time will no longer be visible in my uh, uh, vendor maintenance or my vendor inquiry. They will still be in history for as long as I choose to retain my history. So a few settings that are kind of important. Um, a lot of people don't understand why they may or may not be able to see certain things. Um, that's just a lot of how we want to, you know, hold on to our information, not 
bulk up the the things that we're currently working on and yet not lose information that we need to access quickly. Um, making that backup at the end of your fiscal year. Since we no longer transact in that historical company, then we have that time frame of reference available to us as well. So lots of choices, whether, you not, whether or not you want to have it all visible currently, or if you're willing to go back into historical companies and look for information there, you know, we can certainly keep track of that and be able to recover some things if we need them. Some other things that we do during the course of our calendar year end, it might not be your fiscal year end, but it certainly is your calendar year end, is to actually go through and process our 1099s. And um, I'm not sure if you have not yet heard, but the IRS has uh, reinstituted a Form 1099-N EC, non-employee compensation. And when I, I came across that it, the, the term having uh, reinstated that form, I'm like, well, when was it even a form? And I had to do uh, an almighty Google search and found that it was last used back in the early 80s, I believe. So, um, some things go and hide forever. Some things go and hide temporarily from the government. This one is one that they decided to bring back. And you must have Sage 100 2018 Service Pack 9 or higher, 2019 Service Pack 3 or higher, or Sage 100 2020 base installed or higher in order to have the capability for SAGE 100 to help you process those forms. Um, it is getting pretty darn close to the end of the year. And, and like I mentioned, Brad and I and, and some of the others, we are scrambling to get people updated. Um, this might, if, it, if you're coming at us this late in the year, we may or may not be able to commit to helping you get that installed before it's time to process your 1099s but we certainly want to get with you so that we can help you get through this next year as well. As far as what paper to get, um, the 1099 forms must be on the red pre-printed paper in order to submit them to the federal government if you mail them in. Your recipient copy may be printed on a blank four-part perforated form. We often call that a four-up if that terminology is familiar to you folks. The 1096 summary form, again, if you are mailing these into the IRS, you must use the red pre-printed form. Now, if you go out and you buy that bundle of forms pre-packaged and they're all that two-part form that's already pre-printed, do not fear. You can still use those. We will just have to tease the software a little bit in order to allow you to utilize those pre-printed forms. Otherwise, the, the blank paper that would typically print for the recipient copy, it prints all the grid lines, it, and it will print you one section of the, um, or one copy of the 1099 in each quarter of the paper. So um, if you find that you've, you've got those two-part forms, just let us know, we can help you utilize them. All right, I've kind of beat the uh, accounts payable horse to death here a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about accounts receivable. Um, and, and for those of you that use these modules, you probably will understand things are very similar. If it happens in AP, it's probably going to happen in AR. Uh, so again, as we're getting ready to do our closing, uh, it's, it's really encouraged that you go ahead and make sure all of your data entry, your cash receipts, your invoices. Um, if you're doing sales order transactions, make sure those are updated. If you're doing job cost postings, make sure all of that is updated prior to uh, closing the module. Finance charges. For those of you who charge finance charges, uh, you certainly would want to calculate those finance charges. And then um, you would have to, um, print your statements. And I just happened to notice a question that popped up. Um, and 
and I, it did get brought to my attention. This is a great point. If you are using um, the 1099 to um, e-file, you don't have to have any of the pre-printed forms. So the, um, uh, forgive me, the um, e-filing will send everything in the proper format to the government. Only if you are mailing your forms in will you need to get those pre-printed forms. And another question that popped in, uh, and I apologize if I, if I am going too quickly, I probably should break a little bit and let questions come in. Um, there is, uh, the question is, how do we change uh, box seven for the NEC form? So box seven on your 1099 miscellaneous form used to be what we used for non-employee compensation. And it is now box one on the 1099 NEC form. And there is a utility that is available uh, that can help facilitate that change. And you can get a hold of Brad or me, and we can help you with that. There's also, uh, real quick, I just, I'm kind of answering these as well, just to kind of to chime in there. There are some uh, instructions out there. PDF can be happy to, to send to you as well. Um, if there's something you want to try to, to ride around and, and it's not don't, don't really scare you away from it it's not really that difficult it's pretty straightforward you go in and type in a couple of commands and it'll it'll make that change for you awesome thank you brad okay um back to accounts receivable i'll go ahead and keep pushing here uh we talked about getting your data updated doing your finance charges and your statements again reports that you would want to consider printing um, either at period end or, or more specifically at, at year end. Um, some recommendations, the aged invoice report and the AR trial balance report. Just like on the accounts payable side, the aged invoice report deals with the invoice date. The AR or AP trial balance report deals with the general ledger date. So we can figure out if we have misdated some transactions. Uh, maybe an invoice slipped into a batch that had an, an odd date, but yet the general ledger was where it was. You know, we can see these timing differences because of how the transactions got posted. We might also take a look at the customer sales analysis, or if you're using sales reps, um, the sales analysis by salesperson. We've got the monthly sales report and the monthly cash receipt report. We've got an accounts receivable analysis, and we might even run the salesperson commission reports. So those are some things that are recommended for you to um, grab hold of, but by all means, it is not an all-inclusive list. What happens to AR during year-end processing? Very similar to AP. Uh, the number of days to retain paid invoices. When we surpass that window by the number of periods that have been closed from the time that an, a transaction has been finalized or, or closed because it's been completely paid off, those things will start dropping off after a certain number of days or months has been uh, surpassed. Um, the monthly cash receipts file, temporary customers. Um, there is a concept of temporary customers. We have the inactive customers and we have our active customers. Temporary customers are those with whom you might not do regular business. Maybe they're a one-off and we just wanted to have their information in so that we could process the invoice forms that we need. If we set that customer to temporary and we go ahead and we do our year end process, there will be a point that those customers will be purged from our customer master list. There is an option, however, to retain temporary customers with paid invoices. If that is enabled, then those temporary customers do not get purged at the time of the year end processing. We can choose to, to remove them elsewhere uh, there are other utilities that will facilitate that, but if we want to do it in an automated fashion, 
we can do it during the year-end processing and just make sure that the option is not enabled. Okay, uh, talked a lot about AP and AR. They're very similar. They're the, kind of like the mirror images of each other, but they're very similar in nature. Um, I'm gonna sneak in some information here about inventory management because that's another pretty healthy category that most of you have within your Sage software. Uh, physical counts, you know, tis the time of year to be doing our inventory counting. So we've got the process where we freeze the inventory. We lock that count in with Sage and, and we wanna get our physical count worksheets prepared. Then we go ahead and we enter and update our counts and we get those posted. We also want to make sure that any of our other miscellaneous inventory transactions have been posted. Uh, for those of you who use FIFO or LIFO inventory valuations, you want to make sure that you run the negative tier report and update the negative tier adjustment register. This will marry over distributed inventory layers with inventory layers for which there is a quantity. So as an example, if I have an over-distributed layer of 10 items, that means that I let my FIFO or LIFO layer go negative, which is typically not a great thing to do. Um, and then I subsequently replenish that inventory. Maybe I just had a receipt transaction that happened after my sales transaction. Um, by default, Sage creates a separate layer for the new receipt my inventory might appear to have zero on hand, but if I look at the details, I'm going to have two distinct layers, one positive and one negative. The negative tier adjustment will allow those two tiers to get merged together so that there is nothing in any unique layer and the physical quantity is really most reflective of what's going on in the system. So that's an actual, uh, actually a very good thing to consider doing. And you can do that as often as you like um, throughout a month or throughout the year, but it's just something for consideration. Some other things that we want to do, our inventory valuation report. Um, in the newer versions of Sage, we have the inventory valuation report and the inventory valuation by period report. Um, the inventory valuation report is your inventory as of the moment in time in which you run that report. I can't necessarily put a date on that report. So if it is January 12th and I want to go see what my inventory was on December 31st, I would have hoped that I ran that report on December 31st. There is the inventory valuation by period report. And that report is pretty good. Um, I won't say that it's always perfect, but very, very high confidence, just not as accurate as of the here and now report that we get with the valuation report. Um, purchases clearing. Oh, what a fun topic. This is from your purchase order module. This is that report which we can use to figure out what items are not properly resolved on our POs. And when I say properly resolved, quantity ordered equals quantity received equals quantity invoiced with no back orders. That's, that's the magical equation that closes a purchase order. But if I've got dollars in my purchases clearing report, the concept is, okay, let's take a look at this and which POs are not fulfilled properly or just because we don't have the documentation yet that is causing a balance in our purchases clearing account. That's a, an account on your balance sheet. Again, that is a reconcilable account that we can prove because I can go look through all my POs, I can go look through all my receipts, I can look through all my invoices and anything that is not 100% matched up is gonna be on that purchases clearing of report, give me a value. So um, if those reports get a little out of hand, it is really recommended that we do some steps to clean those up. And again, we've got uh, a lot of information on how to help you with that. 
don't hesitate to, to give us a shout and, and let us try to assist you with that. All right, big bad general ledger. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, because this is kind of the crux of our Sage software, we want to make sure that all of our other modules are closed and they've had all their activity posted before we deal with anything related to the general ledger. Um, print and update any of your recurring journals. If you have any of those, make sure that all of your adjustments have been made for the fiscal year that's about to be closed because we cannot post into closed periods. Um, another thing that we find as we are going through um, different module closings, uh, we might have some discrepancies uh, where we can't find a journal entry. We know that we posted a batch of invoices, but we can't find the entry in the books. Um, first thing I always recommend is to go to the general ledger and run what is called the daily transaction register from the GL module. That can go pick up any unposted source journals where the details made it through, but the GL hadn't made it through yet. And usually once you get that, then you will find that things will start balancing out a little bit better. If you are using budgeting, uh, this is a good time of year to get ready to update your budget for the next year. Um, obviously, we wanna make sure our trial balance is in balance. If we are using any allocations where we are clearing out a particular GL account and redistributing, redistributing it, say that 10 times fast, uh, to a multitude of other accounts, you wanna run those allocation journals. Um, some reports that we recommend, but again, you know, not mandatory, it's, it's what works for you. Uh, the trial balance report, that's always a good one. Your financials, uh, whether you are doing those through Sage directly or if you are using one of the other report writing tools such as Business, Business, was it Business Insights, Biz Insights, BizNet, BizNet, that's the one. Um, Sage Intelligence, um, maybe even FRX or F9. Uh, make sure you get those reports. Uh, General Ledger Detail Report is always a good one. That's one that we don't recommend printing to paper because that usually takes up a few reams, uh, but that we can help you with making sure that we get it to paperless office so that you can have a permanent copy of that stored electronically. <clears throat> Excuse me, what does Sage do at your end with the general ledger? Well, all of your income and expense accounts get rolled up and reset to zero and the net of those transactions gets rolled into the retained earnings account. Um, based on the number of years for retaining various histories, uh, transaction or summary, um, those will get recalculated and beginning balances get reset. So just kind of picture um, a river that's kind of bobbling along and at any one point in time, that's that new new starting point for those summary files. Um, so all of those calculations happen. Um, if you are doing the auto budgeting, then that would be the time that those budgets could get calculated. I am gonna go ahead and open up for questions. Um, I might have buzzed through this a little quickly, I'm not sure. Uh, we've had some good questions thus far. And uh, if anybody has any questions, please either raise your hand or feel free to type into the chat box, or the questions box, forgive me. And um, Brad and I would love to be able to address your questions. Mary, I'm just going to uh, throw a couple things out there uh, with some of the things that I've talked to with, with clients I work with on that, on the, especially year-end processing. Um, just, just so you know, uh, 
you can, in fact, if necessary, you can go into, and I think maybe this is a, uh, a question that just popped up from Susan uh, about closing the GL but have to make another entry. And so the answer to that question is where I was going with this is yes. Um, when you do a uh, closing in GL, uh, if you, in fact, find that there is something that you do need to enter, uh, you can simply go back into the general ledger options, obviously, as long as you have access to that, right? And so one of the things we would recommend is not everybody have access to general ledger options, but as long as you do or can get to the person who does, then you can actually have them set that period back to whatever you need to to post to, okay? So uh, I always kind of like to mention that. Um, a lot of people here, I know, you know, look, the accountant in me, uh, I don't know if Mary indicated or not, I, I do have an accounting background, you know, says, hey, you don't want to be going in and opening and closing periods through options on a regular basis, right? Uh, but, but again, and Susan, specifically, your question looks like popped up here. Yes, you can go back in the options, set it back, make your entries. Uh, at that point, really, um, a lot of people ask. It's not, I wouldn't say it's necessarily necessary to rerun period close. If you want, really, you could probably just go back into options and, and reset it back. What you may need to rerun are any reports, right, that have been generated, especially uh, balance sheets or income statements or anything like that. You may want to rerun some reports to reflect that entry. Um, but as far as rerunning the period close, that's, that's typically not, not necessary because there's not going to be any new purging going on or anything like that for that. So. Right. Um, just as a throwback for those of you folks who may have been around Sage uh, for a while, especially when it was Mass 90, um, before we flipped into the what they call the new business works or the new business framework, um, you had to go back and actually reclose the module. But with the new business framework, and that was effective as of, oh, uh, help me, Brad, 20, like 2005, maybe? Yeah, yeah, it's been a long time now. Yeah, especially in General Ledger, because General Ledger was the first one to exactly. come in, right? So, yeah. Yep. So, yeah. so um, theoretically, you can close, reclose them. Technically, you are not required to. Just go back and reset that period, uh, just like you opened it up. And, and I think, and Mary, you can kind of help me out here. Look, I've worked with the application for a number of years here, and, and sometimes there's some confusion on, and I look, I'm even kind of still a little bit confused about closing in the a subsidiary module versus a, the general ledger at the end because, uh, and I know this to be the case. I mean, if my if my AP module says it is um, January of 2021, once I get to that, you know, that closing at first, as long as my GL's in, uh, 12, I can still continue to post AP right. from, you know, so um, then it's another thing, I guess, just by way of some explanation. So your subsidiary module is not what's driving the, what period you can or cannot post to. That is all being driven by the general ledger. So, um, so and Susan's kind of asked a follow-up question here. Um, so that means with all modules, don't have to rerun period closes. And so, yes, again, Susan, that is that is correct, as, as Mary just kind of explained there with, with especially the new business framework, which has been around forever now, it seems, I mean, at this point it really has. And again, not to, to bore you with all the old details, but there was a time at one, there was a time when you can only have two periods open. And if you tried to get into that third period, uh, it's not that it wouldn't work, but then it would throw off uh, month to date numbers and data files out there that were accumulating data. And so, uh, that is no longer a a requirement, like as as Mary just just mentioned. So you know, look full disclosure: if you don't ever close, um, your system will still work. But both Mary and I, as the as the accountants, are going to tell you that th that's a, a procedure you should. I mean, you should do that on a monthly basis, right? Uh, you know, without question. Until again, obviously, now that we're getting to year end, I know a lot of you you know might have audits or reviews. Uh, and so keeping December open until you get those final adjustments uh, is not is not a problem. And typically that's what people do once they get those final adjustments, make them and then and then do that final you know year in processing. And I know we're not specifically talking about payroll right at the moment, but I do want to caution you. Payroll is the only module 
that you do not want to reopen closed periods. Most especially because your quarterly information gets a little bit more trashed. Um, I had had experiences uh, over the years where somebody did not get their last minute adjustments in for payroll and they needed to put some stuff in, but it was already, they'd already run their first payroll for 20, you know, whatever the next year was. Then they just go ahead and reopen their payroll and then they would close it again and they couldn't wonder, they couldn't understand why none of their current year stuff was in there. It's because Sage wiped it all out. Now it's a little less critical these days. Uh, I will talk about this more here after bit, but that is one module um, I just don't recommend touching. Once it gets closed, just please leave it be and you will be much safer for the for that. Anybody else have any questions here for us this afternoon? Okay. Easy group so far here. Yeah, they um, are. I, I want to go back to one that was asked at the very, very beginning, and um, I, I think maybe this is this is true. I believe, Mary. The I think copies of this or the handouts this, or this. Uh, I think your uh, your slide deck here or whatever will will be sent or can be sent um, if that was if that request is made. Um, is that correct? That is correct. And in addition, we are recording the sessions today. If you would like to uh, have a copy of the recording so that you can review it at your convenience, just go ahead. I'm going to ask you to put a, pop in a question that just simply says recording, and we'll make sure that you get that. If you need handouts, just please say handouts as your question. Um, and that way it will help uh, us figure out who needs what. And oh, that here they're coming. Delightful. Yep. That's, <laughs> plus, I'm also making sure that y'all are awake. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So before that gets too far, the, uh, again, there's another question. Look, this is this is from. Uh, well, actually, maybe I shouldn't be giving out names. I don't mean to put anybody on the spot here. So. Uh, but there is a uh, question about the typical learning curve to be able to efficiently run uh sage and so that that's that's really kind of a well, i'm going to call it an, an open-ended question there right absolutely so, you know i mean it, look it really kind of depends on on what 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 parts of sage that you're in and, and and what your responsibilities are so meaning that uh you know and, and accounts payable for example i think it's pretty straightforward i mean you 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 enter your invoices you post them and 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 go and you know select payments or select checks on a when you're doing check runs and and print your checks, right? So uh, that that to me, I mean, can you know that that learning curve is probably not especially uh, steep. Now, you know, once you get into some of the other modules, uh, sales order and purchase order, again, while they're not rocket science, there are obviously some more fields on there. Uh, you know, then you've got receipt of invoice and are you returning inventory? Now you're dealing with inventory, and and so you know you've got I would say some more. Uh, more learning there and then all the way to uh, anybody out there using a work order or production management, uh, those type modules, right? Um, you could probably speak to this better than I can because I'm not really that familiar with those other than what I've looked at them. They clearly have been even more options and, and information that you mm -hmm. can that you can enter. So um, look, here's one of the things I will tell you. Uh, there's a number of things. One, uh, you know, we are more than happy to assist you with any of that. Um, you know, whether it be training or specific questions that you might have and, and tasks you're trying to do. Uh, I know that there are um, tutorials within within the software. I mean, I think even some short, uh, what, Mary, two, three, four, five minute videos probably. Of exactly. Some, uh, some of the, the, the higher level tasks. Uh, look, here's a here's a key that I use all the time. And I've been, look, I've been using this application for over 20 years from now, but I'll still get in the screen. And if I don't know exactly what, what a field is or, or it's a new one or whatever, you, uh, the, the F1 key and the F1 key will take you to help for whatever particular screen is. And I've found that to be very, 
very helpful. So um, I don't know if, that's, if that answered your question specifically. Um, again, as the as the learning curve, but. Um, and another resource yeah. that is available is out on our website, um, dwdtechgroup.com. And if you go look in the resources tab here, uh, I am I am not uh, unshamefully uh, uh, touting this, but in our software and network tips section under Sage 100, we have a variety of uh, white papers and even videos to accompany those white papers. So one of us is actually walking through the steps of what the question is. Um, you know, how do you reconcile the AR or AP to the general ledger? How do you write off bad debt? Um, if you are not sure where to look for that, you can search by some keywords. Um, if you know exactly what you're looking for, we can go into a particular module and, you know, how to set up vendor specific pricing, how to process prepayments. That's a pretty healthy one uh, these days. Um, you know, so a lot of, of things that are out here on our website, um, Sage's Knowledge Base, uh, the Almighty Google, a uh, lot, of, lot of things that are out there. But um, if you can't find what you need, though, by all means, please let us know, because one of us probably knows what, what we need to do. Uh, yeah, yes. And so mm -hmm. let me, I, got, I do have uh, a number of other questions popping in here. So this is, this is good. I'm glad that this is kind of, somebody gets started there with the questions and then they all start coming in. So <clears throat> um, question, can I change the period forward? And so as an example, you're in January, but you don't want anybody posting back to December. Uh, so you change the period to January. Then when the final entries are here, you can change back to December, run your year in close. And then, of course, you know, put you back to January or, or whatever month you're in. And so, uh, yes, the answer to that question is yes, that is a way to do that to to limit entries back into December. Again, from a from a technical and from a system standpoint, you could certainly do that. OK, um, best place to find classes to get proficient. Um, I think Mary, you know, just went over a couple of them there. Our website with the videos there. Uh, is, is a lot of good information. I, did you, I think, did you just say, you said the knowledge base. Did you also say I, there is, in fact, a Sage University out there, right? I, mean, I did not mention that, but yes, Sage University. Uh, there is a, um, where, in, if you go in there, I can, a lot of times, uh, don't remember where to find them, but the, on the, uh, is it the information center? There are the, I think the videos, so. where are the, what's that? There are. We got feature tours and resources. Feature, yeah resources there you go there you go so there's there's some more some more information there again you know and we are um as i say i mean we are happy to to do that as well i mean we do training for our our clients all the time so um you know and the good look the, the the good thing about that is then we can go specifically to whatever your setup is uh, your database right make a test copy and we can go through your specific processes and and do the training so so we can do that um i don't there know a, uh, is there a video a video on electronically filing 1099s i do not yep. know the answer to that question well if you will bear with me here for just a couple of minutes i will walk you through that process and um, that way it'll be in our recording here today so you can refer to that uh, later on I need to switch to a company here. Sure. Uh, and, closing year in, does, this, does the system reset journal entry number, or reset journal numbers? That is a setting in general ledger options, actually, as to whether you want to reset those numbers or not. I personally prefer to turn that option off. Or I'm sorry, to say never, re to never reset, I should say. Because that's your choice, is, is to uh, never or uh, year end, I think. And so when I'm doing an implementation or we set those up, I, I always set that to to not reset it. But you would need to go to look in your general ledger options to uh, to see how yours is set, to see whether it will reset at year end or not. OK, I'm going to take a real quick segue here while I, I know it's almost time for break. Um, with regards to the 1099 filing, 
A um, couple of things. There is a separate program. It is the federal and state e-filing and reporting functionality that has to be installed on each workstation from which that task will be accessed. So if I would go to accounts payable reports and I would locate the form 1099 tax reporting task and it tells me this has not been installed, that means I don't have the right program available. It's a separate small install that goes computer by computer. It does not automatically download with the workstation setup. Um, once I get in, I have the ability to create new or to create historical 1099s. And I have the choice of creating a dividend 1099, an interest 1099, a miscellaneous, or the new non-employee compensation, or new, not new, however you want to refer to that. <clears throat> we then would have to refer to the appropriate calendar year. Now, unfortunately, my test data did not have any 1099 set up, so I don't have any data here. Um, but the, the functionality, we would walk through the wizard here, and it would step us through various processes. And I can always get with you directly, if you wish, um, later on. Uh, to go over this in a little bit more detail, but uh, it'll walk you through a wizard. And um, let me see if I've got a company here. I apologize. Let me see who's out here. Maybe these guys do. Oh, nope. Doggone it. My new, I did not have that enabled in any of my test companies. Um, but it will guide you through the steps that you need. It'll make sure you have the right federal ID number. It'll make sure you're printing the right form for the right year. Uh, the 1099 miscellaneous forms, typically you have that $600 threshold, so you don't have to do 1099s uh, for amounts lower than that that were paid out through the year. Um, Brad, I do not know what the NEC threshold is. That might be more than 600 or it might, I'm sorry, it might be less than 600. I'll have to get some clarification on that. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm, yeah, I'm not familiar with what, what, uh, what a limit on that one is or not. So, right. I'll probably do a quick Google search here while you're still talking, just to see if I can find it real quick. But, yeah. yeah. Um, but once that is all there in play, and I, I, I know this, I'm doing this off the cuff here, but I just really want to see this real fast. Um, whether I've got one that I can, do a quick show. <clears throat> I bet I do here. Um, but it's a pretty straightforward wizard. Uh, the, the key is that you have your vendors set up appropriately. Uh, you have the information going into the right boxes. And once we know that that is all viable, then we can go through and process uh, 1099, boom. Oh, yay, here we go. This is an older version of, of Sage, but I do have information in there. Um, I don't have the NEC, as you can tell. I can pick the calendar year. Um, granted, it is old data. One thing that it does request or require is the federal ID number. Uh, it will get angry if you don't do that. And then it will walk us through a wizard. Get that screen to pop up here. <clears throat> I might get prompted for the Atrix. That's the engine that, pro that uh, fuels the form generation. Uh, if I need to make that update, I want to do that and get that caught up. I'm going to caution you this time of year. Atrix is constantly dumping out updates. And because Atrix is used for both payroll and for accounts payable 1099s, you might find that you have to do this a few times over the course of a couple of weeks. Uh, I've seen it happen twice in one day, uh, just because of when I, I managed to get an update and then I turned I turned around going back into the same function and it prompted me to update again. Um, don't get frustrated or angry. It is just the software delivering to you the most current data that is available. Uh, 
um, one of the questions here about the the what it, what I generically call the e-filing and recording. Um, Atrix is the same engine that underlies both sides of it. I will talk about the payroll functionality uh, a little bit later here when I go to the second session. Second section, the um, 1099s that is exclusively for AP, but the software updates are all related. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Okay, I do see, okay, I've got a lot of hands up, and so I, I hope those people have been putting their questions, uh, they've been typing those in there, and I think they have been, because that seems to be matching. And I'm going to try and be real brief here, because I do want to let you guys have a break, and then I'll come back to the payroll portion. And with Brad and I being the CPAs on the Stage 100 team, we tend to be the ones that help clients with the 1099s and the payroll forms. So hunt us down. Um, if you have specific questions, we will certainly do what we can for you. Um, so, okay, so I think, I think maybe you just answered this question about the payroll um, there, there was a question about payroll. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it is also using it is also using Atrix, um, right. I, and I think that's what that that question was. And you may have said this as well. I, I always like to clarify this. Um, unfortunately, uh, right now the the program's not written when you get to that update section. If you're not using payroll, um, but it finds payroll updates, it will still download and install them, even if all you have is the AP. So that is correct. Sometimes that's a little bit of a pain. You sit there watching all these states go flying by and you're going, you know, what the heck's going on? And so, uh, but just keep that in mind. It does because it doesn't give you an option if you just want to do one or the other. Um, I'm going to take a stab at this next question. And, and um, I think this is the way it is. It's been a little while. The question, how do you sign up with Atrix? I think when you go through this process and get ready to file, uh, get to that step, can can we not just go in there a place to register at that point as well? One of the options there is. Done so already? Okay. Yep. And I apologize profusely. The version of Sage that I opened up because it's too old, it's not going to let me continue. Um, if we need to shoot me an email, um, I'll try and, and create a video that we put on our DWD tech group website. I'll see if I can't get that posted um, by this weekend. Um, or at least early or sometime next week. Uh, so by by Christmas, um, for sure, we'll have a we'll have a video out there for you that you can go ahead and and review. And then if you've got additional questions, don't hesitate to let Brad or me know. Uh, there's a good uh, good point that uh, uh, user or actually Don made yep. um, yes. that if you are only printing your forms. Um, in either case, whether you're only printing your 1099s or you're only printing your payroll forms, there actually is no registration. Um, right. So, so the registration is only to electronically file. That is correct. So that's a that's a good. I I mean that's yes that's a that's a good thing to to keep in mind. Now, look, I know I think the state of Indiana is one, and probably a lot of states now are requiring electronic filing. Right. So mm -hmm. in, in some in some Places we don't even have any choices. I mean, we have to do that. So, right. Um, but yes, if you are only printing, then there is no need to to register. And again, I think the registration comes up at the at the at time the that you go to e-file. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you haven't if you haven't already done that, you can you can start that process then. So absolutely, um, it is actually a little bit past time that I wanted to try to take a break. But um, I am Mary. Uh, that is my email address there. My office phone numbers, the toll-free number or the local Fort Wayne number. Um, you can also use those toll-free numbers to get a hold of Brad. Um, and I want to thank everybody who has popped in here today. If you are not interested in the payroll, uh, my feelings will not be hurt if you choose to leave at this time. Uh, but if you're if you're working with payroll and you would like to see a few more things. 
please stick around. Let's take let's take a five minute break. I have two o five on my clock, so two ten. I will get started with the second part of our afternoon session, and you can keep chugging in questions. Uh, we will keep addressing them. We'll try and answer them as we're on break here. And um, again, thank you so very kindly for joining us here this afternoon. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I have 2.10 uh, Eastern time on my clock, um, 1.10 in the central time zone. And if y'all are in different time zones, um, good morning. Um, this is the second half of our year-end tips and tricks webinar. And this one in, entails uh, payroll-specific details. And if you've joined us since the beginning, um, basically to uh, submit questions, use the questions chat box and type those questions in. We can get a record of them. We know who asked what, and we'll make sure that you get your questions answered. Uh, as a side note, again, if you need CPE credit, we are offering another hour credit for this part of the session. Uh, please sh email Shannon and note CPE credit in your subject line and she will get letters out to you uh, probably by Christmas, if not shortly thereafter. Um, just very quickly, again, you know, saying hello to any of the newcomers. Um, some things that we might need to keep in consideration as we deal with uh, payroll and year end. We'll talk about some things specific to payroll. We'll talk about the year end processing um, we'll talk about printing the payroll forms with Atrix and talk a little bit about payroll 2.0, which actually is 2.2 now. This is kind of an antiquated slide, but I just want to remind everybody um, back in 2013, uh, it was the last year that Sage maintained the respective payroll and accounts payable forms. Atrix picked up that ball and ran with it. Um, as of 2014, if you want to do any state or federal e-filing for payroll or 1099s, you have to have that program installed. And if you do e-filing, then additional fees will apply. If you are printing everything and submitting to the respective jurisdictions, that's all for free. So you're, you're all good there. Uh, just as a quick recap for the versions when they were released and when they will be retiring. 2020, 2019, 2018 are the currently supported versions and uh, 2021 payroll or uh, 2018 will drop off and then each year following uh, another version will effectively drop off. With regards to this year, uh, we've had a lot of things happen. Uh, first of all, the IRS issued a new Form W-4. And uh, if you are running on Sage 100 2017 or prior, those new fields are not available for you. You do need to upgrade to a more current version of Sage uh, in order to take advantage of those. Otherwise, you'll have to manually recalculate uh, and be able to, to identify what needs to go on their paychecks and subsequently onto their W-2s. Um, there is a website that I have listed here, uh, the irs.gov site that gives you information about the W-4. Um, I had a lot of people asking about that early in the year and it was incredibly confusing, but actually I think if we just step back and remember that, you know, am I married? And does my spouse work? That's one answer. If, am I married and my spouse doesn't work? Am I single? What, you know, how many jobs do I have? So that, that's really kind of the simplicity of the new W-4 form instead of trying to figure out, well, if I had three dependents here and take four exemptions there, yeah, no. Um, it's, it's, Hopefully, so it's supposed to be a little bit easier and it's supposed to take some of the onus off of you as the processors and put it on the employees for them to get what they need. 
If you are using payroll in Sage 120 or higher, there is a relatively new update to payroll. It is payroll 2.20.3, and it is highly recommended that you need that you get that installed so that you can run your payroll for this coming year. If you are not on version 2018 or higher and do not have payroll 2x installed, uh, you can run payroll, but it is not gonna necessarily have all of the compatibility features that are being employed with how payroll gets processed these days. Um, certainly get with Brad or me um, or your or your business partner if you have um, somebody with whom you work that is not DWD and make sure that they help you get this upgraded. It might be early into the year next year, um, but even so, once we get it started, it's, it's pretty good going after that. Legacy versions. What do we do? Legacy and the new Payroll 2X. Um, in the past, for those of us that have been on the software for a while, uh, we absolutely did our closings based on our quarters. Um, it was highly recommended to make that backup because we all knew that data went away if we did not have um, a backup of that before we closed the quarter. Um, it's a little less crunchy now with the new payroll because the tables got redesigned and uh, the data is now being kept a lot more cleanly and more easily accessible. Um, depending on your history that you had, your perpetual history would be maintained. Um, it was mandated that you had to close the quarter before creating and updating checks in the new quarter. Given the new layout, it is a little less critical, but I'm going to encourage you to keep up with how you have done the closings in the past. It's just a good habit and it may save you in the long run. Uh, what we find out with the Atrix, um, we could refer back to historical periods. And that was something that we didn't have with the older version of payroll. Again, like once we closed um, some of our reports, our quarterly tax report, um, you know, certain history reports, those things just did not exist for historical periods because they weren't built into the data tables that way. It is now and it's a lot nicer. Um, what happens during year end processing? And I, I did break it down um, by pre 2018 and then 2018 and after. And I think next year I'm not even gonna bother because I hope everybody has upgraded by then. But if you're still running on 2017 or prior, um, all of your earnings and deductions and taxes get reset between quarter to date and year to date earnings. So we lose that history. Um, your quarter specific reports, uh, that quarterly tax report, that would only show you the current open quarter. Um, your check history file could get purged, um, or if you are uh, maintaining perpetual history, then you could manually purge that file. Uh, terminated employees got removed from your employee master file. And then of course the update of the calendar into the new payroll year and payroll quarter. After 2018, um, you have a minimum of four years of history that gets maintained. Uh, so your records will get purged after that minimum of four years. If you opt for more, then you, the purging won't occur until after the, your set number of years is elapsed. Uh, direct deposit figures for year to date get set to zero. Um, your terminated employees will get removed based on what I call business rules. And that's basically, you know, how much history are we holding on to? Um, things like your time off accruals uh, that are calendar based are updated for those employees utilizing a utilizing that. If you get the opportunity or if you if you're in this and you're doing your time off tracking, the new payroll allows you to accrue based on the employee's anniversary date. So that's kind of a praise be glory hallelujah moment um, because so many of us would have to go back and effectively reset that stuff manually. 
And then of course our calendar will still update. In order to do our forms printing with Atrix or the e-filing and reporting, again, we have to be on version 2017 or higher. You have to have the Atrix utility installed on the specific computer from which the forms will be generated. And you must also be current on your Sage 100 maintenance plan because of those updates that we get thrown at this time of year, especially if your um, maintenance isn't current, then you are not going to be able to uh, access this information. And actually, if you're on the payroll 2.0 or 2.x platform, if your maintenance isn't current for your payroll, you aren't running payroll. Um, so they've, they've got that in place. Uh, to print your tax forms, we've got um, the federal forms. We can run all of our 940, 941s, or W-2s, and all of this can be done on plain paper. So we don't have to get those nasty W-2 pre-printed forms anymore. Um, these can also be e-filed, and if we do use Atrix to e-file, then we will get charged fees by Atrix. Um, I've got a brilliant question that just got asked that I want to try to give a quick answer to. And how do we know what version of pay, pay, bleh, pay roll we are running? And what we can do is at the top of Sage, I'm trying to get my program back open here. Um, there is a help menu, not necessarily this help button, but rather the help menu. And then we look for the about Sage 100, and it will tell us here at the top whether what version of payroll we're running and what version of the software we are running. So that splash screen will give you that information. Um, I'm getting a question about suggestions for e-filing through the IRS for free. And sadly, I don't have any resources that you can do that without perhaps manually keying all that stuff in yourself. Um, I Brad, think your only other, yeah, I, I think your only other option, and look, I, I don't think this is really a, a very viable option. I mean, if you could get, if they allow you to upload a file, you'd have to get a file layout, right? And then you could possibly design a report that would that would pull that data out into that particular layout and save it and upload it, right? I mean, but I think you're going to spend an awful lot of time, yeah. effort, and, and, and money. I mean, as opposed to the, look, I, I know that, you know, I mean, Atrix doesn't, you know, do it for free, but, uh, you know, I mean, in, in my opinion, and it is just my opinion, I mean, I think the service they provide is is well worth the, the cost that they, that they do charge. So, no, there's, I mean, the simple answer is there's not a great way um, uh, for that, that e-filing through the, the IRS that, that I'm aware that, that I am aware of. So, and um, just to clarify, the federal threshold for e-filing is not until you get um, over 250 employees for whom you have issued pay during the year. However, the state of Indiana is a 25 employee threshold. So um, if you are not in the state of Indiana, neither Brad nor I can really formally address your requirement. I would recommend that you talk to your local accountant as to what those requirements are. But Indiana is a minimum of 25 employees for the state W-2s. Federal W-2s are not required to be e-filed until you get to 250 employees. Um, got another was, question that was, just uh, came in. We I'm sorry, the one about the copy, the copy yeah. the payroll. That's the, yeah. You want to go ahead? Uh, yeah. So uh, the answer to that question is it's kind of a depends. Uh, uh, and again, there was the kind of about what what um, Mary had had indicated earlier about the pre uh, 2017 and the post right in the 2018 and beyond. So just to so to clarify completely, if you're on that 2017 or before, yes, you will need to make a copy of that payroll for sure uh, before you process period uh, your year end. Uh, if you are on the newer version, uh, the answer is technically no, you do not. Uh, but I think that Mary and I both 
uh, think that it was a good habit that you probably got into to begin with and to continue that habit and to go ahead and do it anyway, frankly. Um, because in some ways, it's kind of like, uh, I think one of the first things that, that Mary had said in the, in the in this earlier session before doing any kind of period in processing, it's really kind of a good habit to have a backup to uh, to begin with, right? Because, you know, let's let's not be, uh, or kid ourselves. I mean, the, the, the period in could blow up. Frankly, now I've never really—I don't know that I've ever had one, um, but but it could. So uh, it's always good to have a backup before you before you start doing that. Yes, just I I I'm too paranoid. Paranoid is my middle name. Um, <laughs> yeah. So backup, backup, backup. I was working with a client just the other day, and we were playing with backups and restoring. And right in the middle of a restore, as a matter of fact, they lost power. Um, so, you know, everything came back up, things looked okay, but I said, let's just put it back again, uh, just to be safe, because you don't know if something got flipped from a one to a zero down in the guts of the data. Okay. Um, so with that, um, you know, you, you're not required to make that backup, but it is strongly encouraged to make that backup. Um, as I was talking about um, some of your state forms, some of those are required to be e-filed. Um, again, my, my Indiana peeps realize that the unemployment form, the UC1, that must be e-filed now in some fashion. Uh, you can use Atrix to do it, or you can go through the hassle of creating the file layout. Uh, again, probably more expensive to go that route than it would be to just let Atrix do it for you. Um, and here again is a recap of the Indiana law. If you've got 25 or more, you must e-file your state uh, W-2s especially, other forms. Um, the UC-1 is, is, it doesn't matter if you're one employee or, or 10 employees or 150 employees or whatever, that one has to go. Um, if you're out of state, go ahead and check with your accountants and uh, have them help you determine what your state's requirements are. As far as Atrix, um, just note that it is uh, update time for Atrix, and we've got all kinds of things coming and going, uh, whether it is because of the 1099 stuff or if it's the payroll stuff. And I'm going to go ahead and kind of walk us through uh, what we might expect to see. And I really wish I had that in the first half, and I apologize that I didn't, um, but I'll get that out there. Um, so if we go into our payroll under our period end, and I'm, I'm pretty much going to blow through the next few slides by doing this, so don't worry about the slides so much right now. Our form looks a little bit, um, forms look, or the, the screen looks a little bit different. Obviously, we can choose now, instead of the radio buttons we used to have, the new version of payroll gives us a drop down, so federal forms or state forms or history forms. And if we pick a state, then obviously we have to decide what state. I'm gonna just go ahead and do a federal form here and hit my lookup. And I can see all of the different forms that are available. If you get in here and you haven't been in this for a while, and you don't see 2020 on everything, don't panic. Because the 2020 W-2s, you may not have gotten the recent update that has that W-2 form yet. That might still be saying 2019 for some of you. Don't, don't panic, it's okay. It will um, update, it'll prompt you to do that update. I'm gonna go ahead and pick the W-2s here just for kicks and grins. Um, you notice that it is because it is an annual form. We don't have to worry about picking a quarter. If it's a 941 or a UC1, we would have to select the proper quarter. And of course, uh, the information here, a lot of people are, are like, why don't I have information filled in? That is because this information comes from your company maintenance screen in Library Master. So when we do make that copy, 
and we opt to do our forms from the historical company. When we create that company copy, it does not populate your address and federal ID information. And that is why this will come up somewhat blank. So you have the choice of either hand filling it in here or going back to your company maintenance first, filling that information in and then coming to process the forms. So we go ahead and let it proceed and then Atrix goes off and does its happy stuff. If it has detected that you need an update, um, it will prompt you with that um, automatic update screen. Uh, my general recommendation is just always do the update. Always do it. Um, it will just save you down the road a little bit later. It's um, cumulative updates will get installed. Uh, if for some reason you have to have your Sage 100 or you get a new computer, that's a, that's a big thing these days. You get a new computer and you get your Sage 100 on there and then you try to go into your federal and state tax reporting or your 1099 reporting and you used to be able to run those forms and it, you get yelled at for that software not being there. Well, we got to go get that install made and then because it's a base install, it's going to update all of the um, it's going to do one big lump sum update. So in the setup wizard here, as we go walking through this, um, typically it's just go ahead and say, no thanks, I want to start processing. They do have test drives available, but I find those limiting. And I know that I can always start over on my W-2s if I need to. Um, Good question that just came in. Uh, can you process in your main company but change the year and the period? Um, in reality, if you are still processing in your live company, when you go to run your um, forms, don't bother changing the year and the period in your payroll options. Simply make sure you choose it correctly when you generate the form because you get offered the choice if it's a quarterly form for both the year and the period. If it's an annual form, just make sure you type in the correct year. So we don't have to play with resetting the, the time frame in our options. And again, that's not necessarily encouraged unless there is a really, really, really valid reason to do that. And in payroll, I don't see that there is. So um, we get to confirm that we've got the correct federal ID number. And um, if any of you happens to have multiple Sage 100 companies that are all elements of the same federal ID number and you need to report all of your W-2s together, we have the capability of merging that information. Or if you are just using a single payroll company then we'll just choose the latter option and let it walk through. Because I didn't have anything populated on the main screen, I would have to put things in here. And of course, it will bark at me if I neglect to fill something in. I think I got all the base information there. Um, most of us are um, filing for our own company or employers. Um, to rehash that question about changing the year and the period, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead and change it in Atrix. That is the perfect place to make that change. When we start rolling through and we get to state and local tax items, uh, we may see some nasty red bars. That is simply an indication that I do not have the correct tax number or tax format for that number. So by double clicking on it, I can then edit and I can drop in my correct number. Um, I'm gonna ask a real quick question here for the benefit of uh, one of our guests. Um, are there any of you folks out there that have done the multi-company payroll form processing where you combine multiple Sage 100 companies to do the full forms processing? 
And I'm going to undo everybody's hands and ask you to raise your hand if you have done that. I know I have done it for a couple of clients in the past. Typically, I don't do that these days because I don't have that combined. Okay, it does not appear that any of us here today have done that other than, like I mentioned, I tested or I did it once for one client. Um, Brad has tested it in his sample data. Um, it's, it's interesting, we have to kind of be careful on how we do it, but it is very doable and it actually works out really, really well. So once we go ahead and identify the proper um, state and local codes, obviously if we have Indiana local reporting, we're gonna have a list of all of our counties here. We wanna make sure those are configured properly. Um, we've got some uh, questions about uh, anybody who's exempt. Um, do you have employees who are clergy members? Do you want to use the control numbers? Do you want anybody to only receive electronic W-2 forms? And then we have some uh, options here that are part of the W-3, uh, whether you're a 941 payer or you are an agriculture entity or you are um, a household employer or anything like that. The other box that is needed these days has to do with what kind of an employer are you? And the short answer to this is if you are a not-for-profit organization, you're going to pick a 501c non-government. If you're some sort of state or local governmental agency, you're gonna pick one of these choices. Otherwise, you say none apply. And I think the majority of us are the of the none apply. We've got options to be able to do third party sick pay and whether or not uh, your business terminated its existence for that calendar year. And as we keep bebopping through here, it's going and grabbing all of that data and combining it and getting ready for us to be able to make some modifications. Um, to answer being able to access the system configuration, that is a role permission. If you do not have that access, then no, you will not be able to get to that particular task. So as we see here, we are brought into kind of a grid-like layout. On the left-hand side, we have our static information for the name and address and the various check boxes that we might have for like a retirement plan or third-party sick pay. And then on the right-hand side of the grid, we have all of our numeric information relating to the different boxes for which data has been recorded. And it's then mostly a matter of just walking through, getting all of the um, data tied out, and making sure that everything matches up. These figures up here at the top should be representative of what goes on the W-3. So if your totals aren't working out, uh, or if you've got some other ways to cross-check this and things are not working, uh, we probably had some issues with our data entry and we can either correct it here or we can figure out how to go back and correct it in the historical company. And if you have already closed your year, and you, are, you think you need to make corrections, we're gonna do it on the spreadsheet here. We're not going to go back into SAGE and backdate any payroll corrections. And then we could just go ahead and walk through the rest of this. Now, I don't wanna spend the whole afternoon talking about doing this, but again, I'll see if I can't get a video up that can walk us through that whole process and try and have that um, by Christmas. So Merry Christmas, yay. Um, we'll go ahead and do that. Uh, now, when it comes time that you're trying to do the updates and you get errors, uh, and that's fairly common, 
Um, we have some suggestions on how to get around those errors. Oftentimes it is related to our Internet Explorer settings uh, because we don't have the appropriate security enabled. We are not allowing the correct websites or functions to come through. Uh, maybe our IT has a network port blocked, uh, so we need to ask them to open up a specific port because the Atrix websites need the ability to communicate through these mechanisms. And if you continue to have errors trying to download it automatically, we can always go out and manually download it and run it on your workstation and then just go back into your federal or state e-filing and um, click through the automatic update. It should detect after you've done the manual install that the automatic that the, the version is correct and it'll bypass trying to download anything. <clears throat> For those of you who may or may not be aware, Customer Portal, um, that is a pretty nice resource. It has visibility to all kinds of things uh, related to your Sage software. Um, certainly the knowledge base, uh, which is one huge piece that a lot of us use. Um, if you want to get information about your product, and product uh, if you want to get downloads for your software, you can get to links on that. You have to be what is considered an authorized user. Uh, Sage has to have your name on file basically and know what your email address is and then you have to set up an account to access the customer portal. Um, you can contact Sage directly and I don't even think you have to technically go through customer support. I think that might be what sales support Brad or Don for the uh, customer portal? Yeah. Um, at one point in time, um, I don't know, it's, it's been a while since I've done this. At one point in time, somebody from the company had to complete a uh, add, add user kind of thing, or at least uh, mm -hmm. say that this email address was, was uh, valid and then took about a day from there. And then, then the user could go to this customer's portal, key that in, it would let them continue the registration. Right, but if they're having trouble, um, you know, there's some other ways to get a hold of them. There is a link on that website. So if you go to customers.sagenorthamerica.com, you'll get a login prompt. And if you're still having issues getting logged in, um, there's a link there that you can chat. I was just, I think, I was just thinking if there were some other resources um, to get assistance to get set up to the portal. We do not have your usernames and passwords for your portal access. Um, we can see a lot of information about your account, but your Sage portal access is not one of those pieces of information. You have to go to Sage to have them help you with that. Uh, let me do a little recap. Um, for those of you who have already made the transition to Sage 120.18 or higher, uh, this is old hat. But for those of you that might be on the cusp and have not made that update yet, what's changed? Um, we have updated data entry screens. Everything now looks like all the other modules, um, work order accepting, uh, because that's a different topic. There is a concept called departmental security. So we can permit or deny people access to specific departments within your payroll employee listing. We have the concept of processing payroll in batches. So you could have someone who is handling perhaps owner manager payroll who has the authority to view that information versus someone who's just doing regular payroll and they may not have the authority to view the managerial payroll. You can separate that payroll into different data entry batches and then update them all the person with the authority can update all of that all at once. Um, if you have um, any of my Ohio folks, especially customizable tax profiles. So instead of just picking a federal and a single state and a single local code, <clears throat> we can have multiple local codes and we could have as many as we need. Um, 
we were there was an enhancement that was developed by a third party that would use the uh, multiple local codes. This is no longer necessary for the more current 2.x payroll because that those multiple jurisdictions are accessible within the definition of these tax profiles. Um, payroll taxes are calculated uh, via cloud-based calculation and the updates are being delivered to you rather than you having to download it and manually install it yourself. So whenever you get the message, there is a tax table update to be installed. Would you like to download it now? I would say, if you've got the moment to do it, do it as sooner rather than later because it can have different um, payroll tax rates, perhaps local codes change. Oh, and that's the other thing, local code tax rates are delivered to you now. You do not have to maintain those independently anymore. <clears throat> and that's kind of my run at Life, the Universe, and Sage 100 Payroll. Do I've you? I've got a. Uh, yeah, I, I want to go back. And, yeah, I want. I want to go back and and uh, touch touch base on <clears throat> something we said long long ago. Uh, or I should say at the beginning of this, as far as the payroll version. Uh, interestingly enough, and I think I do remember this now. If you are actually running Sage 100 uh, 2018 and you go to the help about Sage 100, actually the payroll version does not show up in that screen. And I actually confirmed that on my laptop. I got the same thing. So uh, just FYI, if you're trying to find your payroll version there, you have, uh, I'm gonna say about three options. Uh, there's library master, uh, setup system configuration is one. It looks like Mary's going to go through that. Now, part of the, what you may run into is sometimes these particular areas get locked down, right? So if you go to modules, actually, and scroll down, you'll see payroll, and it will tell you what that module is or what that version is. Um, if you don't have access to this, you probably won't have access to the next one. I'm going to go ahead and run through all of them to begin with. If you actually go to reports in the same library master, there is a system configuration listing, which maybe you will have the ability to at least view that that would be another option um and if and i think that what's generating that report okay same thing there scroll down find your payroll <clears throat> and then finally uh, a third option if that doesn't work if you get and you know uh well then you got a fourth option was the third one would be go to file run and type in uh, asterisk or star info. And that will pop up a screen. There you go. And it will also show show you. And if you get roadblocks at all of those, then you're going to have to go to somebody who's got the kind of the lower go. half of your payroll version. Yeah. Thank you. And if you get roadblocks on all of those, then you're just going to have to find somebody who's got access to one of those previous options right there to find out what that what your current payroll is. Yeah, and the other one I, uh, that Brad said actually was that fourth option is the installed modules. Oh, the installed listing. modules have it as well. Yep. Um, yeah, that's well. You know what? That's um, there. You go. Uh, you know what? Check um, check for me here as well, Mary. I mean, that heck, that would be a fifth option. Check. Uh, what about company maintenance? Does that uh, if I look in the? I the don't think it maybe? does. Oh yes, yes it does. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah, How, we yeah. got, there's, there's five, six or options there, I guess. So uh, hopefully one of those, if you're on that version 2018, anything above 2018 and 2019 should be in that help about. But it is not in the 2018. And again, I confirmed that on my my laptop. It did not show up in there on my 2018 version. So. Awesome. Uh, let's see here. If we need to make changes in a W-2 and the current year um, and made a customer or a company history copy, um, you can, yes, go ahead and make the change as far as um, the historical copy in order to get the W-2s out. Um, 
I, you know, obviously we're not going to reopen and go back into it for the live company and, and make that change. Um, that is a lot of times what I do when I assist clients at the end of the year because they will need to show benefits like um, shareholder insurance or auto usage. Um, obviously, they're not getting their numbers back until well into the month of January, so we can't go back into December to process that to get that on the W-2. But if there has been a copy of the company that was made uh, prior to closing, then I'll do those kinds of changes in that copy company, but I have to run the W-2s from that copy. Awesome questions. Gosh, I'm excited. This is some good stuff. Does anybody else have anything that they would like to have us go back over or need to ask about? All right. I want to thank you so very much. Um, first of all, I want to thank Brad for being here to be my second set of eyes and ears because um, these can get really, really crunchy if uh, I was doing these by myself. So thank you, Brad, for being here. Thank you for all of your help. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I want to just thank you folks so very kindly for being here. If you need CPE, again, please contact Shannon. Let her know that you need CPE by putting that in the subject of your email, and she will ensure that you get the proper um, CPE letter. Anybody else have any other questions? All right, well, I want to bid you all a very blessed holiday season. Thank you for attending today. And if you need anything from us, please don't hesitate to reach out. We will be more than happy to assist.